edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. Now, we have to draw up an accounting of the past week. We have some pluses. We have some minuses. And above all, we have the need to mobilize and get busy to avoid the worst in the next uh, couple of years. Let's start, first of all, with something positive, which is the failure of the Supreme Court, and in particular of the rats cabal, Robert Salito, Thomas, and Scalia, to uh, destroy, essentially, the uh, Obamacare system, which is, after all, the outcome, such as it is, with all of its flaws and insufficiencies. This is what we got out of all these years of uh, agitation. Naturally, the uh, preference here on this program is Medicare for all paid for by a Wall Street sales tax of 1% on the stock bond and derivatives turnover of the Wall Street hedge fund hyenas and zombie banks. So that remains the goal. And I'll tell you how we can get to that goal. But with Obamacare, we had a frivolous lawsuit a piece of nonsense that never should have gotten to the Supreme Court. And instead, uh, this was now voted down by six to three. So we have the rats cabal split. Thomas Alito and the uh, irrepressible fascist Scalia, who still should be impeached, they went against it. They wanted to destroy it, hurling the entire system into chaos. Uh, but Roberts, uh, who is essentially doing all these things from the point of view of the survival of the Supreme Court as an institution, uh, broke away from them, and also Kennedy. So these are people with better developed political antenna than the uh, hardcore reactionary ideologues who live in a world of reactionary scholasticism all their own. Uh, Roberts could see clearly that if he tried to destroy Obamacare at this point by denying the ability of the federal exchanges to pay subsidies to people in these reactionary states, this would uh, hasten the, uh, the, the falling of the Supreme Court into a situation of absolute uh, revulsion and hatred and uh, indeed obstructionism by the American people, right? This would become a vestigial organ, very much like Roger Tawney, right? T-A-N-E-Y, the pro-Confederate Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice during the Civil War, uh, whom Lincoln was able to, had to ignore at various points, right? Simply um, not carrying out his decisions because the guy was a raving uh, Confederate. That's that's where the Supreme Court would go. It would become a kind of, um, again, a vestigial uh, organ. Uh, and the way this would happen, of course, is that we have various studies ranging up to 17,000 possible dead, dead Americans, if the entire Obamacare system were simply uh, thrown into chaos. So Roberts feared a backlash, a colossal political backlash against more meddling, more sabotage, more obstructionism, right? In the past, we had Tawney, we had Roosevelt fighting the nine old men. Uh, but now I think the, um, the willingness of people to put up with this nonsense is somehow less. Uh, I hope so. So this is now a settled law. 16.4 million people now have insurance policies under Obamacare. The percentage of those uninsured has gone down from 18% in 2013 to 11.9%, less than 12%. More than 6% of the U.S. population has been able to get health insurance under this. So um, it's uh, some kind of progress. Uh, therefore, what, what comes out of this is that Obama, uh, uh, Roberts wanted to shield himself from the consequences of wrecking Obamacare. But what he's now done is pushed it over onto the Republican political branches, that is the Congress and the presidency. Imagine a Republican running for president in uh, 2016 saying, and ladies and gentlemen, I promise to strip you of your Obamacare coverage, right? So 
by that time, it'll be 20 million people at least. And you can put a family multiplier on that of at least three. So that gets you up to 60 million people who would either be impacted themselves or their families impacted by this insane, uh, lunatic Republican wrecking policy uh, to sacrifice uh, human lives, American lives, in the name of this Austrian abstraction of uh, anti-big government. So uh, these people are on uh, Sunset Boulevard, right? They're headed for the last uh, roundup politically, I would say. And the same thing goes for Republican congressional candidates. There are some districts where that stuff will sell, but I think they're getting to be fewer and fewer as the demographic wheels uh, inexorably turn as they do. Now, how could this turn into, how could Obamacare turn into Medicare for all, what these mushheads insist on calling single payer, although nobody knows what that means. Medicare for all would be the goal. Well, uh, the next big financial panic could happen sooner or later, but it will come unless and until uh, we get the reforms demanded by the tax Wall Street party. But when the next round comes, it will probably be accompanied by chain reaction bankruptcies of the insurance companies. Um, because of their insistence on dabbling in the toxic world of derivatives. So when the various insurance companies that operate under Obamacare and are surviving thanks to Obamacare, when they come hat in hand saying, please make good our derivative losses, it's only $50 trillion. Well, then at that point, I think these people will be uh, out of the picture, that will be the end of them. Anything useful in their operations can be incorporated into a future Medicare for all system. That's my perspective at this time. But it is worth noting that right now in the United States, if you are afflicted by some uh, disease, you can get coverage. You can go and sign up. Uh, whereas that was not the case before. So a certain increase in human dignity has been affected. And remember, these are the economic rights of the American people. Don't listen to those uh, monstrous individuals like Ron Paul or Rand Paul who tell you you don't have any rights. You do have rights. And anybody who takes advantage of the American polity as a location for their business operations must cough up for the needs of the American people. And don't let somebody who says they're from Austria or uh, some other place, uh, apologies to the real Austrians. Uh, this is the Austrian school of uh, economic obfuscation. So that's uh, your right. And the right has somehow, though battered, it's, it's still there. Now, the other side of it is the negative, the free trade sellout, fast track. Uh, what, what do we find out? Obama, of course, did not campaign for re-election saying, I will sell you out once again in the uh, so-called free trade era. Notice, these are not really free trade. These are ways to codify and anchor outrageous oligarchical privilege and oligarchical abuse at a level higher than the national government. So it's harder for us normal people to reach them through parliaments or, and or court systems, right? It's supposed to be put in some super national, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a zone where these laws can no longer be, be touched or, or changed. First of all, let's not give up on stopping fast track, right, on stopping you now these individual trade packs as they go through. You might scoff, right? You say, well, now it's all hopeless. No, I don't think so. I don't think it's hopeless. And I'll tell you why. We'll look at New Hampshire and Iowa in a second, and we'll get an idea why it does make sense to discuss some strategy. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Let me... Uh, point out that I have been uh, cited by Pravda.ru uh, as a, uh, well, as commenting on the Charlie Hebdo. This is Pravda.ru on the 18th of June. Pravda.ru writes, as Webster Tarpley has clearly laid out, those who say no to Washington soon pay the price. 
French President Hollande in a recent interview stated that sanctions must be lifted against Russia and that Putin has no intention of invading eastern Ukraine. And uh, within a couple of days, uh, the um, Charlie Hebdo. Now, notice uh, the new scandal about the U.S. National Security Agency spying on the French government, including Hollande. Is that how they knew somebody knew weeks or maybe months in advance that Hollande was preparing to break with the idiotic sanctions policy demanded by Victoria Nuland, Samantha Power, and the rest of the uh, crazed crew uh, of Foggy Bottom, the State Department. So, uh, so thank you to Pravda. Uh, R U, and I, I, I certainly deplore the tendency of many mushhead uh, left liberals to to talk about this incident as if it had anything to do with free speech or anything to do with Muslim or not Muslim. This was geopolitics at the highest level. And it, it had very little or nothing to do with the things that most people have decided to pin uh, on the incident. I, in that sense, following uh, the the uh, the intent of the uh, terrorist controllers. So, what? Why would there be hope that you could stop the uh, coming of another round of free trade? The what? The Trans-Pacific Partnership, and also then the. The other one with uh, the European Union. Well, just look at the mood of the voters. That's all I can say, right? This is still very early on. It's uh, May. Uh, we've got another year and a half, I guess, before the presidential election. But look, Trump declares his candidacy. He's a charlatan. He's a buffoon. But he then rockets to number two. I guess it's in New Hampshire. He's number two in that poll. And then also in New Hampshire, Bernie Sanders is now within eight points of Hillary Clinton. This is within the margin of the poll. It could be 18 points or it could be uh, a statistical tie. So I think you've got at least the possibility in this election cycle to have a, uh, a an outcome which is not the one pre-planned and desired by the Koch brothers, Soros, Wall Street and these other rich predators that uh, afflict our nation. So in that case, there are ways in which the fast track vote process could intertwine with the dynamics of the primaries that could conceivably block this, uh, torpedo it, prevent it from happening. Now, uh, turns out Obama was working closely with Ryan. Imagine this. Ryan ran as vice presidential candidate for Mitt Romney to get Obama out. And then Obama turns to him as an advisor on how to get this all through the Congress. Right. Uh, Ryan saying, don't talk about yourself. Don't saying that it's an authority for you, but that we need the authority and leave yourself uh, out of it. Always hard for a narcissist like Obama. Um we also find, unfortunately, that the methods uh, used uh, by the opponents of this treaty are simply inadequate. Um, the left Democratic group, uh, the Progressive Caucus, I guess, or things like that in the left wing of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives, well, put them together with the mushhead left, put them together with the AFL-CIO, it hasn't worked. And in particular, I have to extend my practically my condolences to the AFL-CIO, to labor in general. They have been humiliated with this. The, the word in Washington now is that labor has no clout, that labor is impotent. Labor can't do anything. Well, why don't we look at what, what could have made it better? Here's what could have made it better. Shift the entire debate several degrees to the left with the demand of a 15 percent protective tariff. A 15 percent protective tariff makes rejection of this uh, fast track and the rejection of the Trans-Pacific Partnership makes all of that sound quite moderate. In the same way, if Obama, at the beginning of this health care business, if he had said, my plan is Medicare for all, here it is, whatever came out at the other end would have been several degrees better 
several degrees more generous for the American people, several degrees less concerned with the interests of these uh, predatory uh, financiers. So, uh, guys, Trumpka, right? Trumpka would need now to essentially in, and analyze what he's done wrong, do some self-criticism and figure out that you need more active demands, not just no, but a 15 percent protective tariff uh, in such a way that you'd actually be bringing the jobs home. But the other thing, though, um, to notice about the Supreme Court vis-a-vis -vis the uh, fast track stuff, notice that Roberts had to pull back on what I would define as a class based mass traction life or death economic interest. In other words, when an institution of government directly attacks the lives and the solvency of large numbers, right, tens of millions, scores of millions of people, there's a possibility of a real potent backlash. And uh, that's why Roberts backed off. Notice that the same kind of power that you see in an issue like Am I going to be stripped of my health care? Right? Kitchen table issue. That same power does not reside in any kind of process reform, and certainly not in campaign finance reform, where the average person uh, has very hard time seeing how it's ever going to benefit them. Right? Why not do something to benefit them directly rather than asking them to, to trust you? Because they're not going to trust you, and they don't have time. Similarly now, with this uh, fast track and trade, this issue is much obf obfuscated. The only way to cut through that fog is the demand of the 15 percent protective tariff. And of course, the radical ahistorical people are out there. Today on the Diane Rehm Show, National Public Radio, we had one of the commentators saying, the Republican Party has always supported free trade. <laughs> My God. Go and look at the moral tariff, in other words, the bedrock of the entire Republican Party from 1861 until the end of the 19th century and well beyond was protectionism. William McKinley was a classic protectionist. So um, this is all radical, uh, radically anti-historical. One or two more points on this when we come back. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Top here in Washington, D.C. So I just went through my plan B for Greece. In other words, it's better to stay in the euro if you can under dignified and reasonable conditions. But if Merkel and Schäuble have really lost their minds and if Lagarde is really so insane, well, then – uh, you can't control what they do, and therefore you've got to prepare yourself for whatever happens. And that includes, of course, uh, seizing the central bank, issuing credit for production, barter deals, a debt moratorium, and the other things that I just said in the last uh, segment. So let's, uh, let's proceed from that to our correspondent in Athens, Michael Chiotinas, and get an idea of what the mood is and what the uh, the state of the uh, the talks, so to speak, might be. Michael, welcome. Hello, Dr. Tartley. So, tell us. You were saying before uh, during yes. the break that there's a uh, a sense that the Greek people are fed up with the phonetications of uh, Merkel, Schäuble, and the IMF. Yes, of course. They they are um, any. Uh, anyone you uh, anyone you talk to is saying uh, Tsipras should get get on a plane, come back, make a statement, and um, you know <laughs> push the button, push the push the destruct button. Anyway, uh, the thing is in these negotiations that we are trying to 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 salvage the euro itself. We're not to we're not trying to save Greece. Greece may be better off with a national currency. But we are trying to put some sense into the into the European leadership. Uh, so we're not trying just to save Greece. We're trying to save Europe. That's my view. That's my view of what uh, Varoufakis is trying to do. Anyway, the thing is that this war is very much played in the at the level of appearances, and whoever controls the media in, in Europe shapes 
the image of reality. Uh, also the bureaucracy, the kind of incomprehensible maze that is the institutional structure of the European Union is nothing but an obstacle when you try to come into honest negotiations. So every time the Greek government would come with a comprehensive proposal for true and substantive reforms, um, they heard time after time, you know, Greece has brought no proposals, we are still waiting for Greek proposals, etc. You have heard this. What they meant was, because reality is shaped by us, your proposals are going to be called proposals whenever they, co they coincide with our proposals for you. Anyway, to make a long story short, given this pressure, the Greek government made more and more concessions in the sense of, of the procedures followed. And in the end, almost surrender uh, in the sense of accepting fiscal targets. Okay, so the Greeks said, okay, let us meet the fiscal targets that you think are right. We think that they're wrong because you fail to accept dynamic assessment. But hey, you have all the power to shape reality, so let's take that this scenario. So they put, the, the Greek side put together a proposal. It had some austerity, but mainly targeted towards the rich. Um, so they said, okay, we will accept the targets. They are recessionary, but along with debt restructuring and a big investment program, we will pass it through Parliament and begin implementing it. Uh, well, that was Monday. Uh, when the EU summit on Greece accepted this plan that had 8 billion uh, euros of new measures for 2015 and 2016, right? Okay, so these were things like 4G revenue for, from 4G licenses, telecommunications. This has to do with cell phone technology. Right. Harsh taxation of, on gambling and online gambling, in other words, parasitic activities. Tax hikes on high income brackets, uh, personal income instead of VAT and uh, these kind of taxes. Tax hikes on corporate income tax. It has to do with businesses from half a million of annual turnover and upwards. Uh, and increase in the employer's contribution for pension funds instead of pension cuts. So it, it was all the, in the way of uh, revenue instead of cuts. So. There were reactions from certain Syriza MPs. Cyprus um, took the first round of humiliation in the eyes of the, Greek uh, of the Greek population. Well, he's signing another memorandum, more austerity, uh, this kind, blah, blah, blah. Legitimate criticism, let me tell you. But they failed, of course, to mention that without a deal for debt restructuring and investment, there were going to be no deal at all. But anyway. Uh, the next day, the IMF comes in and says, what? This, proposal's, uh, this proposal is, is recessionary? Well, th thanks, Captain. Five years now. <laughs> and, and 8 billion in measures are not enough. We need 11 billion in measures. And not by increasing revenue, but by cutting, pe by cutting pensions. Um, they, gave the, they gave out their own plan, which included... It, this is very important. No government revenue from telecommunication licenses. Let me note here that Greek telecommunications are controlled by Deutsche Telekom. Uh, no tax on gambling, so no taxing on parasitic activity. Uh, inhumane VAT taxes, value-added tax, in other words, regressive taxation regressive. on electricity, uh, food, this kind of stuff. Price controls on medicine in such a way that will destroy Greek local pharmaceutical industry. Uh, in other words, in, in the, the, uh, making German pharmaceutical um, succeed. Um, VAT hikes on hotels, which will undermine the Greek tourist industry. So what is revealed And how here, about the islands, right? That you can't go to Mykonos and have your, uh, your vacation. Yeah, yeah. So what is revealed here is that they are not interested in fiscal targets. They want to destroy every competitive advantage of the Greek economy, every chance Greece has at recovery, impose political domination, set the basis for further conditionalities forever, make Greece an absolute colony, and sweatshop to bring their, I don't know, their, their factories from China over here. But it's also, a, it's a class-based uh, approach, right? It says, you know, the, 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 the crisis is going to be paid for by working people, not rich yes. oligarchs. Yes. 
But there may also be another dimension, a political dimension. Uh, maybe they want to propose measures that are so outrageous that simply by seeing Tsipras, hearing them, and not abandoning the negotiating table in a furious state, just that, this image, that with this image they will humiliate Tsipras as much as possible and force the left platform of Syriza, its inner party left-wing opposition, to revolt in absolute indignation. Couple that with the fact that the leader of this party, Topotami, you remember Topotami? We heard uh, that he was at, he went to he went to Brussels along with uh, with Samaras to uh, yes. meddle. So this guy Theodorakis was at the same time in Brussels supporting the IMF positions and saying that he's ready to back the Greek government so it can vote any kind of deal to save the country from bankruptcy. All this rhetoric. Also, he attended the dinner party with people like prime ministers of Finland, the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, these people. The austerity the plan, ghouls and oligarchs. Yeah, the, the plan, I think the plan is fairly obvious. Break up Syriza by making the left platform MPs revolt and then put together a government uh, with what is left of Syriza, followed by Tsipras, um, led by Tsipras, um, plus Topotami, Pasok, the old socialists, and perhaps the conservatives. Uh, so there you have it. This is an attempt... I think, uh, at a forced re regime change by breaking up Syriza. Of course, this was averted because they underestimate the power of a party with democratic processes in the, on the inside, you know, democratic discussions and decisions obeyed by all. Um, so this kind of a coup d'etat it's, it's the, it's the oligarchy's wet dream in an obvious way. It's quite clear. It's, it's transparent, if you like. Uh, to a significant part of the Greek people. Uh, let me tell you, and I will close with that, that in the past few days, the corrupt mass media are more friendly towards Tsipras himself, but <laughs> not Syriza. So okay. they're trying to make this happen. Thank you, Michael. That's a great rundown. We'll see you next week, and uh, let's see what we do with this uh, program on uh, Plan B. And we'll be right back on World Crisis Radio. Well, Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. Um, the Tax Wall Street Party is interested in increasing operations in such states as New Hampshire, Iowa, and South Carolina. If you're in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, or nearby, if you're in Boston, if you're in uh, southern Minnesota, I guess, uh, give us a, an email. I believe you can send it to taxwallstreetparty at gmail.com. I guess I'm going to have to check that. But taxwallstreetparty at gmail.com. The other thing you can do if that, uh, if you want to be absolutely sure, go to tarpley.net. Go to the Speakers Bureau. There's a contact feature in there, contact box. Put uh, Iowa or New Hampshire or South Carolina in the subject line. I guess this is going to be the, the best way to do it. Go to, go to tarpley.net, Speakers Bureau. Send me a, uh, a little note. If you'd be interested in participating in some projects by the Tax Wall Street Party in, again, places like New Hampshire, Iowa, South Carolina, and uh, some such, right, uh, we would like you to come forward um, and we'll be delighted to, uh, to, to be in touch. All right. So um, Roberts feared the backlash on a mass traction economic issue. And those are the ones to use. In other words, if you want to get some political power, make sure you build your house on mass traction economic demands that anybody can understand, like Medicare for all. Everybody knows exactly what it means. Now, at the same time, today, the Supreme Court uh, affirmed, I guess, marriage equality, uh, gay marriage. Um, I always thought this was an open and shut case. Because of the 14th Amendment, no state is allowed to deny anybody the equal protection of the laws. That is something brought to you by the Union Army, courtesy of Grant, Sherman, Sheridan, and Thomas. We now have marriage equality, and that's all to the good. On the one hand, a wedge issue falls. Karl Rove or his ilk will not be able to win elections by turning out uh, bigots to vote for George W. Bush in 2004, as he did, this issue will now go away. 
it goes a glimmering. And that's what, as it should be. The compelling state interest here is that we need to promote the formation of stable families, economically viable families, but with, with stability in them, and family formation so that we can provide a suitable nursery for the labor force of the future. This is the essential humanism, if you will, of the uh, economic uh, approach that you've got to promote families. And what qualifies as a family in this kind of a rubble field of a society, what qualifies as a family is going to be largely up to those involved. So whatever it is, anybody is better off in a stable family than as a free-floating, alienated uh, individual floating around in the anomi of a modern uh, big city or anything like this. So there's a compelling state interest in this. Uh, and again, you don't want to put up barriers. You don't want to tell anybody no, with, with a couple of uh, exceptions. But the idea, therefore, is promote stable families. That's family values. And put some economic muscle behind it, too, to make it easy. Um, out of the Republican candidates, I guess it was uh, candidate Huckstery, Huckstery, Mike Huckstery of uh, Arkansas, said that he was appealing from the Supreme Court to the Supreme Being. Uh, and that he would not accept it. Well, uh, I'm sure he's very uh, radical, but I don't think he's going to take that very far. So um, we're hoping still to defeat these uh, trade pacts. Now, I got to talk just very briefly about Greece, right? We have to now entertain the fact, we have to, to look at the idea that Greece may indeed be forced into default by Merkel Schäuble and by Madame Lagarde, a.k.a. Lagarde. So now the question is, what should Greece do? The first thing is, uh, don't, be the, don't do anything that will make you look like the aggressor, right? Be extremely defensive in your tactics, right? Make them drive you out. If they're going to drive you out of the euro, make them do it in the plain light of day. It is important that the IMF, the European Central Bank and the European Commission, be seen as the aggressors. If you are driven out, you've got to declare a state of emergency. Declare a state of emergency and rule by decree under whatever emergency provisions the Greek system offers. The next thing, declare an immediate and total debt moratorium on all debts, public and private, because all foreign exchange is going to be marshaled and uh, distributed and used, assigned, uh, according to the dictates of national economic survival. And to make that easier, another point, you've got to nationalize all the banks. All the Greek commercial banks have got to be nationalized. Then you've got to declare capital controls. If you want to take money out of a bank, you've got to uh, satisfy a government official from the Greek treasury. What are you going to do with it? And if you want to export money, from the country, uh, then you're going to have to, to uh, justify that in the eyes of a government official from the Greek treasury, somebody working for Varoufakis, and I hope Varoufakis will be good uh, in that if it comes to this. Um, so capital controls and exchange controls, these are, you know, again, they've been used in uh, Malaysia, they've actually been used in Iceland lately. Uh, and uh, to some extent, they've, they've also been used in Russia, Belarus. Um, so you've got to have uh, very, very strict capital controls and exchange controls. You've got to also think about barter deals. You've got to go outside the normal IMF uh, and even payment systems and see if you can't make a deal with an oil producing country like Russia or somebody like this. You've got to keep that uh, gas pipeline coming. You've got to do all sorts of unorthodox and unpredictable things to make sure that you have food, fuel, and other necessary uh, components. Then, in order to keep your economy going, you're going to have to seize the central bank. You're going to nationalize the Greek central bank. If you're forced back to the drachma, this is the only way to do it. But don't let that central bank continue as the plaything of rich oligarchs who have been supporting Samaras. Nationalize it. 
make it a branch of the Greek treasury. Again, Varoufakis gets more uh, responsibility. What are you going to do with that? Well, you're going to issue 0% long-term credit and uh, other credit at very, very low rates, right? Maybe not 0%, but maybe 1%, half a percent, depending on what it is. But when it comes to infrastructure, where you're producing these huge things which are collateral, you've got to get busy on roads, you got to get busy on ports and docks, might be time for a new airport, uh, certainly a new uh, electrical delivery systems, and so forth. Uh, the one thing for a country like Greece that usually works extremely well is housing. You've got to focus on things where you can produce the components in country. In order to do that, you would need to do an in-country resource census. In other words, how many unemployed workers do you have? How much cement can you produce? How much steel do you have? Uh, housing is one very obvious one. Another one would be shipping and shipbuilding. Um, the, the Greeks, of course, the truck drivers of the ocean. Right? They used to have a big shipbuilding uh, industry, maybe uh, getting down to 0% and 20 or 30-year maturities. In this case, you could um, begin to compete once again. So look around your economy for things like that, infrastructure, basic industries. Um, and then, of course, you've got to find something. To, to get some foreign exchange, right? Tourism is an obvious one, but it can't just be that. So we'll be back in just a minute on World Crisis Radio. Back on Crisis Radio, Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. It's the afternoon of Friday, June 26th, 2015. Just a couple of other notes on Greece. Uh, there would have to be a uh, thoroughgoing shift in the uh, provocative and destructive attitude of Madame Lagarde of the IMF, Lagarde, for you uh, out there in uh, certain quarters. Um, this uh, provocateur, provocatrice role of this Madame is uh, pushing the entire world towards a big crisis. And the Eurocrats and Eurogarchs are all telling themselves, oh, we've got all the firewalls built up. A Greek uh, default, no big deal. Grexit, no big deal. Yeah, indeed, big deal. And we'll tell you, uh, just in terms of the numbers, Greece would have to pay 1.6 billion in June, 6.9 billion in July, 5.6 billion in August, and 6.1 billion in uh, in September. Total over 20 billion euros. But of course, this is a joke. This is chicken feed. This is pin money. Compare that to the 27 trillion offered by the Federal Reserve post Lehman Brothers. Uh, and remember then even the U.S. Treasury got into the act with 750 billion U.S. dollars. Right? So compare that to the 20 billion euros uh, owed by Greece. However, uh, this could now come together. Um, a lot of people, even including the people on NPR in the morning, are saying there's going to have to be a haircut. There's going to have to be a debt write down. It is inevitable. Why don't you, Eurogarchs and Eurocrats, you Merkel, you Schäuble, you Lagarde, why don't you recognize that and act accordingly? The only, the only way to get out of this is, as has often happened in the recent past, the U.S. will have to discipline Merkel. Say, Merkel, back off. Schäuble, back off. Deutsche Bank, back off. You don't own Greece, right? You're not going to be allowed to drag the world into this abyss. Now, how could it happen? Let's focus again. Ukraine. Here we have uh, an article uh, published here on the 25th, meaning yesterday. Ukrainian finance minister Natalie Jaresko, this charming gun mall from Chicago, doesn't rule out that Ukraine will not be able to make a $120 million coupon payment on July 24th, said Goldman Sachs Wednesday of this week. Here's what they say, according to Bloomberg, Ukraine will not make the July 24th coupon payment and will enter into default at that point. And we do not expect the ad hoc committee 
to accept Ukraine's latest restructuring proposal. So these people are implacable. They want the pound of flesh for the IMF. This is ridiculous. Uh, Ukraine wants a 40 percent debt haircut. Well, uh, <laughs> it's going to be hard for Lagasse to have her hands dripping with blood. Also notice, why be a member of NATO? Why be a member of the European Union, right? Why be part of these groups if you get nothing out of it? Uh, it's a lot of people are going to be re-examining what is the point of this, right? You submit yourself to their rules, and then when you need help, they give you this. It's absolutely crazy. So Ukraine, Greece could blow at the beginning of July, in a couple of days now, and Ukraine a little bit later. And then, of course, we go on to the, the usual ones, right? Argentina and Venezuela. Now, a um, couple of other uh, important uh, points. First of all, Armenia. Color revolution in Armenia. And remember, the, the uh, U.S., unfortunately, the CIA, MI6, they have learned nothing, nothing. They don't realize these are hostile acts. They're acts of war in a, in a way. I think we ought to proceed to ban color revolutions in the same way that we've banned poison gas. That's about the level of these color revolutions. Uh, the, the target had been Macedonia, right, to stop that, that – um, uh, pipeline, a gas pipeline by Russia coming through. And then, uh, well, uh, we have to have something also for Armenia, because Armenia is now the target. Uh, according to Russian officials quoted by the Moscow Times, and I'm sure many other places, Russian officials see color revolution in Armenia. Russian uh, lawmakers said Wednesday that rolling protests on the streets of the Armenian capital, Yerevan, could be the first stage in a color revolution, similar to those that have toppled governments in post-Soviet countries, including Ukraine, Georgia, and Kyrgyzstan. Konstantin Kozachev, head of the International Committee in Russia's Upper House, Federation Council, says it's no use deluding yourself. All color revolutions have developed along these lines. So it seems to have not succeeded in Macedonia, and it would now be important for this to fail also in uh, Armenia. So uh, this is one to watch. But again, this reckless uh, policy of delving deep into the Russian sphere. Armenia is practically a, a protectorate. It is a ward of Russia, protected from Turkey and other countries that, that surround it, right? It's one of the most firm alliances you're going to find anywhere. Um, and of course, let's look to Greece, right? If, if the IMF financial warfare goes on, undoubtedly the preparations are coming for a color revolution in Athens. So let's watch out uh, for that one, too. Uh, now we got to switch over to some uh, some economic uh, issues here. But um, first of all, let's just look at the, the Middle East. Uh, notice uh, Matt Van Dyke. Matt Van Dyke, a U.S. mercenary fighting on the side of the Libyan rebels, jailed in some by one or the other of these uh, groups, has uh, been exposed by Syrian girl. We thank Syrian girl for her. Uh, yeoman service in this, and that is that this character Van Dyke was uh, traveling around the Middle East. He was aware that the Syrian rebels had chemical weapons uh, before they began to be used on a large scale, and this Van Dyke also told uh, Sotloff. Uh, that the way to the way you make contact with these people is you let yourself be kidnapped by them, and that's how you earn their trust. So, uh, and then you get uh, beheaded. Unfortunately, what it proves is that the people that ISIS, the Westerners that ISIS has been able to kill, are those who deliberately, foolishly, put themselves under the control of these crazies. So Van Dyke fought alongside this, the Libyan insurgency, went to Syria on a pro-rebel 
mission. And uh, he also wanted to get in touch with al-Nusra, al-Qaeda. So one wonders. Uh, we're also told that uh, the Syrian Electronic Army has hacked Van Dyke's email, and that is how we know what we're talking about here. We also uh, – this has now been, uh, been uh, touted by uh, Amy Goodman and the rest of these uh, characters, uh, and, and indeed on, uh, on MSNBC and uh, other – uh, mainstream sources. They're they're swooning over Matt Van Dyke. He's a Christian. He's organizing a Christian force allegedly against uh, ISIS. Also, uh, we've got the uh, life and adventures of Moaz Mustafa. Right. He's seen that the narcissist Jeremy Scahill puts himself at the center of a documentary film, and Moaz Mustafa wants to be uh, in no way inferior in narcissism to Jeremy Scahill. So he's doing the same thing. Um, let me also point out in this, this sort of demi-monde, uh, Max Kaiser had to have his program this week was to mock and attack Greece, saying that the real model for class struggle is Taylor Swift. Well, I want to debate that any time. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. Remember, if you're in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, uh, do go to my uh, speakers bureau there at tarpley.net. Use that contact box. Send me an email if you'd like to get in touch. Be contacted by the Tax Wall Street Party for all kinds of interesting world historical activities. Now, we're transitioning to some uh, ecological issues and some uh, related issues. The stars and bars will be coming up soon. But uh, right now, we warned against the Armenian color revolution, the Macedonian one. Tell Gene Sharp to back off. Tell Gene Sharp to call off his dogs uh, and Utpour and the rest of them. Now, the other thing, though, is um, you notice that the Republican Party has skated close to the abyss a couple of times lately. Uh, and one of them is this uh, Obamacare thing, right? In other words, they would have been blamed for that. And they would have been expected to fix it, except they can't agree on how to fix it because they have a lunatic caucus that would obviously reject any constructive proposal. Now, here we have a reactionary Republican like Governor Hogan of Maryland. Uh, we just this past week got the news that Governor Hogan has been stricken by an aggressive cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, I believe. However, just before that, he had been to Japan and started singing the praises of the Japanese maglev. And why not bring the magnetic levitation train to the Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C. corridor? It would be a godsend uh, for this entire Region And he seemed to have been uh, recruited to that point of view. What I'd like to illustrate with the case of Hogan is it is no longer possible in many places to be a hardline Republican and have any hope of being returned to office. So much so that Hogan has now conditionally approved the purple line. The purple line is a light rail. It's a trolley car, essentially, that would go – uh, along the northern edge, outside the Beltway in many cases, but uh, uh, the northern edge of the D.C. metropolitan area, and it would essentially be the beginning of a circle line. Look at the look at the Moscow subway map. They have a circle line that goes around the outside. We, of course, here don't have that. So the idea is at least have a, a, a trolley line that would go from Bethesda, uh, over to uh, Prince George's County. And Hogan now says he's willing to do this, but he wants the state contribution cut from 700 uh, mil uh, million to uh, 168 uh, million. That's uh, obviously a big cut. It would be 23,000 jobs over a period of six years, just the kind of thing you want to do. But he wants the Montgomery County contribution to go from 250 million up 50 million to 300 million and similar sacrifices by Prince George's County. Can't we get the Federal Reserve to be forced, obliged, coerced to open up a window, an infrastructure window, zero percent? 100-year bonds. Buy the Maryland state bonds for this purple line, 
And again, it's the beginning of a circle line. It's something you absolutely have to have. If you think this country is going to be here for a while, maybe they don't think that, uh, then it has to happen. So um, once again, infrastructure is absolutely key. Now, we got a transition to the question of the papal encyclical. First of all, some people are trying to kid themselves about what's in here. I have to quote again from the encyclical, quote, a very sol solid scientific consensus indicates that we are presently witnessing a disturbing warming of the climactic system. A number of scientific studies indicate that most global warming in recent decades is due to the great concentration of greenhouse gases released mainly as a result of human activity. I'm sorry, this is not proven, and this is a dangerous and unscientific affirmation. Where does it uh, come from. Um, we've also got this other rhetoric uh, in it that um, there's too much consumption and exploitation in rich countries. Well, the, the notion of consumerism is an illusion. Where are the rich countries where consumerism is a problem, where people are wallowing in opulence? Well, there are such people. They're the 1% or the one-tenth of one percent. They are the oligarchy. Why don't we focus on the oligarchy rather than this generic we, uh, humanity as a whole? Nobody is well served by this. Um, so these are, these are important um, points. The other thing to remember, and this will become obvious in the discussion, Malthusianism, zero growth, is a pagan cult, and it is inadmissible to make compromises with such a pagan cult. Now, where does it come from? I'm afraid it comes from, as we indicated last time, certain forces inside the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Uh, one of these is Bishop Sorondo of Argentina. Now, um, I wondered where his outlook had been developed. <laughs> what I found is that uh, his namesake, this is M Murion, Murio, sorry, Murio Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo was considered to be the last of the Catholic nationalists of Argentina, la ultima figura del nacionalismo católico. And I'm reading here in the obituary of this uh, person, Murio Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo, who died at age 99 in 2012, I believe, uh, reading here in Clarín of uh, Buenos Aires that uh, Murio Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo, now this is not the bishop, this is someone whose relation to the bishop I'm trying to explore, and I'm, I'm appealing to people who know something about this to give me a hand. Um, he had been born in the Calle Florida. Well, that's Fifth Avenue, Park Avenue, that's uh, pretty pricey. And uh, this, uh, the, the late uh, Murio Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo uh, had uh, died, as I say, a couple of years ago. Uh, his father had been a government minister in the Uriburu dictatorship of uh, Argentina, and Murillo Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo himself had been pro-Mussolini and pro-Franco uh, and also uh, something of an anti-Semite. So I'm wondering if people in um, Argentina can help me out by situating this Murillo Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo in his family relation to the current uh, bishop. So what we will see is that he is? Uh, he seems to be, uh, in terms of training, from the Dominican order side of things. And this, of course, brings with it St. Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle. And I'm afraid that, that Bishop Sorondo, a lot of his work revolves around Aristotle. And I think this is also going to be a problem for the, uh, for the outcome on climate uh, science. Back in a minute on Full Crisis Radio. So uh, Bishop Sorondo, the head of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, can, I think, be fairly classed as an Aristotelian. And again, the problem that this raises is, for Aristotle, the kind of justice that emerges most strongly is distributive justice, 
um, the question that the modern world is facing is production justice. Wealth has to be produced before it can be um, can be distributed fairly. Um, so therefore, let's also go on to the other person, right? The, really, the the, the most um, uh, well shocking example is the role of uh, the um, uh, Hans Joachim Schellenhuber. Hans Joachim Schellenhuber. Hi, Jot Schellenhuber. Schellenhuber. Um, who is this guy? He is, in a word, Merkel's version of John Holdren. Right? We know John Holdren, the um, extreme uh, environmentalist who has been Obama's uh, science advisor the entire time. Well, it turns out that Merkel, of course, has somebody similar. And this is known as the um, uh, Scientific Council uh, for uh, Environmental Change. In other words, it's a, a fairly active and loud uh, adjunct to the uh, Bundesregierung, right, to the German federal government and the Bundeskanzleramt, right, the federal chancellor's uh, office. So Schellenhuber, called John Schellenhuber by his uh, his friends. Now, <laughs> interestingly enough, Schellenhuber is variously described as an atheist, I think that's what he describes himself as, or as a pantheist. We'll look at this. But despite the fact that he's an atheist and a pantheist, he has just been appointed by the Pope to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, a rather shocking uh, development. I, uh, I sympathize with all you Catholic scientists out there who tried to serve the church loyally, and then you find that an atheist is being preferred uh, over you. This is uh, not a good uh, recipe. So um, Schellenhuber has come out in favor of the Gaia hypothesis. This is sort of the idea that the Earth is alive, that it has a uh, physiological aspect to this uh, planet and that, uh, therefore, Gaia uh, is the goddess that presides over all this, and that um, Gaia is locked in a struggle with Shiva, the forces of destruction. And it goes back to this guy, James Lovelock. So this is scientific pantheism, if you will. Uh, it is atheism. Uh, and in terms of practical measures, not uh, not unlike Holdren, um, Schellenhuber wants population control. He has um, declared, I think repeatedly, that the carrying capacity of the planet is one billion human beings. Now, as I have, I think, been most prominent in, uh, in the world in uh, pointing out, the notion of carrying capacity is drawn from the Venetian charlatan, Gian Maria Ortes, who said it at 3.5 billion with the technology of about 1790. He thought it was 3.5 billion. And now with, uh, with uh, Schellenhuber, we're down to 1 billion. Well, uh, how would you get from 7 to 8 billion down to 1 billion? And I'm afraid... That looks very, very ominous. That, that I'm afraid uh, it is unavoidable to speak in terms of the danger of genocide as part of any such um, effort. I would also point out that the, the obvious um, fallacy of any idea of carrying capacity is technology, that the reason we have human society today is because of constant scientific innovation, scientific, technological, industrial, agricultural progress based on innovation and new technologies. And that is why, again, the notion of consumerism as uh, a large-scale problem, I, I think you can certainly say – the one tenth of one percent are are guilty of consumerism. Fine, let's convict them. Let's let's find excise taxes to uh, to cut that down. But remember, what is necessary for a standard of living cannot be found in St. Francis. It has to be found on the uh, leading edge of technology. The technologies that today are on the horizon that are not yet here. You have got to provide children 
with the, with the technological preparation for that in the home. You've got to have technology, science, and classical culture in the home. And that is an expensive proposition. Education is expensive. It has to go on. These, these are really not forms of consumerism. But you cannot expect to cut the level of consumption around the world and think that you're going to do any good for the third world, right? The notion that you're going to take wealth from the United States, Europe, and Japan and somehow dump this into Africa, it is a fallacy. There's not enough, and it will never, ever work. And I'll tell you some anecdotes about this stuff. My experiences with the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and Justitia at Pax in the late 70s and the early 80s. So that's Schellnhuber. He's Merkel's guy, Merkel's Holdren, and he has just been inducted as an ordinary member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. What could be going on? Well, um, you have to remember, the biggest contribution in terms of finances to the Vatican comes from Germany. It is the church tax, the Kirchensteuer. When you get a job in Germany, they ask you, are you evangelical? Are you Catholic? What are you? And if you're any of those, you have to pay a tax, and that goes straight to Rome. Now, remember, we pointed out that because of the uh, reckless, irresponsible, and fanatical, hysterical German energy policies— Germany faces a grim economic future because the energy price is now so high because there'll be no nuclear, there'll be no coal, there'll be no nothing. You're going to be left with windmills and solar cells, and this is a bad joke. Does Merkel regard her Wissenschaftlicher Beirat, right, her scientific council uh, for uh, Umweltveränderung, is she going to try to use that to get everybody into the same boat. In other words, she's sitting there saying, misery loves company. I have already priced myself out of uh, most uh, energy markets. I'll make everybody join me, and then we can equalize it that way. Well, very, very uh, unlikely. Now, the other thing about the, um, the um, encyclical, how long would it take for an encyclical to be rolled back? Um, it can be done. It's been done recently. It's been done, I'm sure, many, many times. I can cite maybe one. Um, when you, we have to remember, the encyclical is not covered by papal infallibility. No way. That has nothing to do with this. This is just an opinion. Uh, Pius the Ninth put out the syllabus of errors in 1864, where he essentially condemned most of the presuppositions of the modern world. It was an unfortunate and uh, very, very uh, painful document. Well, uh, Leo XIII, whatever else we may say about him, he certainly realized that that could not stand, but he can't. you can't just take it back, right? You can't cancel it. What he did was to put out his own encyclical, Libertas, in 1888, 24 years later, which essentially began rolling back some of the main anti-modern, uh, anti-science, anti-democratic, anti-free speech, anti-religious pluralism aspects of the syllabus of errors. So uh, we've got a Gaia pantheist or atheist in the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, I see great trouble ahead. And this is painful for us because we fundamentally sympathize with Bergoglio, but there is no need to go all this way. Uh, it is uh, an excessive adaptation to this uh, current of opinion. And again, the paganism is going to be a real problem. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. This is uh, a discussion of the um, Confederate flag and related uh, issues, right? Is this the week they drove old Dixie down? Well, um, we ought to uh, essentially um, look at what was going on here in, uh, in more realistic uh, terms. Uh, the Confederate States of America was a slaveholders' rebellion uh, carried along as uh, an oligarchical project uh, and uh, done 
in in such a way as to uh, destroy the United States on a world stage. And it, it occurred by no coincidence at the height of the power of the British Empire after the 1848 revolutions, after the Opium Wars, after the French invasion of Mexico, after the um, uh, British and French attack on Russia. And uh, naturally, uh, my approach to this is, remember, I am America's Civil War lecturer, right? My September 1863 lecture on the Russian fleets in New York and San Francisco is the most popular Civil War lecture on C-SPAN video archive since 2001. So throughout the entire sesquicentennial, the 150th anniversary, the number one Civil War uh, lecturer uh, is is me. So um, what are we left with? Uh, this uh, symbol, of course, carries with it uh, a, a historical fabrication, which is the idea of a lost cause that somehow uh, is romanticized and sanitized. We're told, among other things, that uh, that it had nothing to do with slavery. Maybe we should start with that. Um, if we look at the Confederate Constitution, and there's a you can find this on uh, Wikipedia. It's actually quite good. The Confederate States Constitution, uh, presented as uh, contrast to the actual uh, American uh, Constitution of uh, of uh, you know, four score and seven years uh, earlier, what you find is that. Uh, Slavery is is one of the bedrocks of this um, entire uh, document. Um, for example, the U.S. Constitution never says slavery. It does not dignify slavery with mention, but it says persons held to service or labor, and that includes whites. That includes indentured servants, whereas the Confederate Constitution says we're all about slavery. And here it is. Article 1, Section 9.2, Congress, Confederate Congress, shall have power to prohibit the introduction of slaves from any state, not a member of the Confederacy, but then uh, Article 1, Section 9.4, no bill of attender, no ex post facto law, and no law denying or impairing the right of property in Negro slaves shall be passed. So there it is. Slavery as a permanent, unchangeable fixture of the Confederate States of America and anchored in the text of the Confederate Constitution. Let's go on a little bit. Article 4, Section 3.3. How about new states that come in? Can those be free states or slave states? Well, the answer is they've got to be slave states and nothing but. The Confederate States may acquire new territory, and Congress shall have the power to legislate and provide for this. However, in all such territory, the institution of Negro slavery as it now exists in the Confederate States shall be recognized and protected by Congress and the territorial government. And the inhabitants of these Confederate States shall be able to take their state, their slaves into any territory they want. And of course, there are other provisions that say, if you're a Confederate slaveholder, you can take your slaves into any other Confederate state and nobody will disturb you. There are also some very good quotes, which we probably don't have time to go into. Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, um, at the time of secession, at the time of this um, Confederate Constitution, which I believe was enacted in Montgomery, Alabama, at the time that that was the, uh, the Confederate capital, Alexander Stevens was adamant. He said, we are the first government in world history that has recognized racial superiority of whites, racial inferiority of blacks, and we are going to build our entire system of government on it. Now, of course, once this war was lost, right, once this insane adventure had uh, played out, um, let's see if we can find this exact uh, quote. Um, the lost cause essentially says 
Um, it was not about slavery. It was merely an attempt to, pr to protect political institutions and a social uh, organization and what we have. And Alexander Stevens went along with this. He said, in effect, that it was simply uh, incidental. It was not the main thing. So he shifts from the absolute centrality of slavery in 1861 to a post-war downplaying of this entire uh, issue. Now then, uh, we also need to think about the, uh, the view of the uh, Confederate flag. Let's see if we can find some quotes here. Uh, the, uh, the computer always uh, moves it when you uh, when you need it both uh, when you need it most okay here we go um, even when Robert E Lee died and even when um, wh that was 1870 and when the, uh, a, uh, a uh, monument him was erected in Richmond in the uh, 1890s uh, there was a lot of resentment among the Grand Army of the Republic Grand Army of the Republic being the Union uh, veterans, they were incensed to see the display of the Confederate flag. The in, in the Indianapolis Journal said the demonstration in Richmond for the the statue to Lee 1890 is to be deplored because it will tend to restore the old South and to make the generation now coming into control of the South adherents of the lost cause of the Confederacy rather than American. Patriots, and indeed, how can you uh, do both? Uh, even more extreme was um, the uh, response to the death of Jefferson Davis a little bit uh, later on, the presidency of the uh, Confederacy. And uh, you'll see there that the Northern accounts are full of words like rebellion, treason, uh, and the like. So I think it's probably an interesting moment in American history that this symbology is being dumped. And we'll see you next week on World Crisis Radio.